What's happening, everybody? Thank you for tuning in to another episode of the Crash Bang Boom Drumming Podcast. Got a recurring guest and drummer Lev Weinstein of many bands, including Corrales, Pyrolatchers, Anacon, Woe, and like literally like a hundred other bands. And by literally, I mean uber figuratively. For this one, Lev updated me on the last three years since we last spoke on episode 53 of the podcast. And we touched on keeping up with double bass chops, garden hose metaphors, not psyching oneself out, and some of his thoughts on the positive ways of increasing one's skill set. No shortage of killer information. And if you're into taking a remote lesson with Lev, give him a holler at lev.weinstein at gmail.com. And that spelling is W-E-I-N-S-T-E-I-N. I'll also give you a link in the description if it's a little bit easier. And if you do take a lesson with him, make sure you refer to him with his preferred redneck pronunciation, which is Leverage Weinstein. Crash Bang Boom Podcast can be found on my SoundCloud YouTube pages, as well as Google Play, Podbean, Stitcher, Luminary, iTunes Podcast, and more. Check out my Facebook and Instagram pages for additional content and updates. Please give me a like and or a follow if you could. Support is appreciated. Shout out to my sponsor, New Orleans Record Press, who's pressing the hell out of some records and has a quicker turnaround than most in the industry and can help you from everything from design to mastering, electroplating, vinyl, coloring options, packaging, and more. They've got a handy little real-time quote generator to help you out. But if you're looking to put something out, you might as well put it on vinyl, because that shit sounds good. And that's NewOrleansRecordPress.com. Keep your eyes and ears peeled for artists offering online lessons, master classes, workshops, just like today's guest is offering, as well as fundraisers, charities, GoFundMes, and more. Or even websites like SaveOurStages.com, who are looking to save this nation's venues that are feeling the burden during a time where a congregation of boneheaded assholes who run the country don't value the arts and simply don't care to provide assistance. Help any way you can. So here we go. Lev Weinstein, part deuce. Get your diapers ready. Crash, bang, boom. Crowds go mad with joy. Yep, yep. Lev Weinstein, part two. Holy shit, it's been like three years since we spoke last. It's been a long fucking time, man. What have you been up to the last three years? And apparently, I don't know if you know this, but we're amidst an air AIDS apocalypse and everything's kind of fucking weird right now. <laughs> Things are indeed incredibly fucking weird right now. In general, in the in the past three years, I've been burrowing ever deeper into mo- most of the same, same shit I was into the last time we talked. I guess a couple months ago now, I um, stumbled on her old podcast and I, I listened to it because I couldn't entirely remember what sort of stuff we talked about. And it, it resonated a lot in terms of a bunch of the same ideas and notions, just sort of more fully developed and all that sort of stuff. But yeah, the past couple of months in general have been very weird indeed, as I'm sure they have been for, for you as well. Totally, man. Jesus Christ. The last time we... Hooked up, uh, we were talking about the the various bands you were in at the time. So, I mean, I believe, uh, from what I recall, there was Anacon, obviously, Kralis, Pyrolatris, and I think another <laughs> one or two. And then we talked some stuff about uh, evolving uh, ergonomics to play faster music and then adjusting that for longer form mm-hmm. songs like Kralis plays and the kind of uh, half sort of molar method using but uh, upper arm whipping into a half molar mm-hmm. kind, of, kind of thing. So... I know we talked about that, but um, you did uh, Leva Palooza between then and now, correct? <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, indeed. <laughs> I think that was uh, what was that? I think it was like winter of 2017 when we did that. And uh, I just need to correct you: the um, the the pedantry. It's important. It's, it wasn't Leva Palooza. It was uh, Lev is a loser. Oh, Lev is know? a loser. Which, uh, gotcha, gotcha. Right, right. right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, you need you need that certain that certain little uh, chemical touch of self-effacement to make it cooler you know it's important <laughs> totally totally man <laughs> that was wild dude you how many you played with what all four of your bands and like rotating songs throughout the night yeah man it was five and uh it was it was absolutely a trip it got so surreal but it was a lot of fun uh and, and one of the one of the things we were able to do was unfortunately the venue which we always wanted to do it at was a uh, typical new york story going to get shut down imminently i I think i think let us lose it was in december and it was closing by like new year's or something yeah so not only were they down to have this idiocy but they were like you can you can like rack all of your guitars on the walls drill as many holes and put up as many holders as you want amazing uh make it like you know Make it look like a car set there so just just we can rotate through. Um and, and that plan worked to kind of perfection. Like I was 
I was sort of excited for it to be way more chaotic and break down and just be ridiculous, but it, it honestly didn't really happen. It kind of went as smoothly as it could have, although there were some amazing moments, like uh, one of my dudes in Woe went across the street to get me a slice of pizza, <laughs> but I can't remember if he, if he just thought he had time or if he forgot what the order was, but long story short, we just started, uh, we started a tune with Adam, and then he sort of ran up on stage flipped the bird to the entire crowd, flung his bass on and got right at it. So nice. There were some moments like that which were amazing. But yeah, it's just, as you say, it was this crazy song-by-song song rotation where everybody was just sort of coming up and down, putting their putting their gear back on the wall, grabbing it. Um, and there's enough there was, there's enough overlap of, of guys between the bands that it started to get really surreal and confusing for me, I remember. Right. Sort of being like, wait, wait, which which one? Which one is it? Yeah. Who's, who's up? What am I doing? Wow. But uh, the, whole, the whole experience was, was fantastic and, and bizarre. And, uh, I want to do it again in some new stupid form at some point. Yeah. We'll see. How long were you <laughs> up there playing drums, dude? It was, I think, roughly four hours. So what? Like the, the YouTube... <laughs> the YouTube video of it is about two and a half hours, and that's just the songs, right? right. That's with all the uh, all the swapping time cut out, and like the swaps were quick, but yeah, there's still you know a couple a couple, a couple minutes at least each time. So I think it has to add up to um, to probably another hour plus, but I don't I don't know exactly. But it was a long it was a long time. Jesus, it was, it was uh, pretty pretty comically long, and, and you know some breaks and. Uh, I did eat a slice of pizza at some point up there. Chris from Ball at some point during a Gary on song, I think, came up and gave me like a back massage nice. during the song. <laughs> um, somebody gave me a shot, which I really should not have, have slugged down because that just, I was in enough of a physically weird space that that just hit me like he's on a brick. I remember. Oh my God, I guarantee. Did you not, did you not have to piss at some point while you were up there for the, all that whole time? I, you know, something I find often when I'm playing normal shows, and I, to be honest with you, I just don't really remember, but usually I feel <laughs> like, the, unless those things are, like, insanely pressing, um, like this one Crowley show where, where there's a, a mess up with, like, lineup order, and I literally hadn't even paid the bill on this, like, gigantic brisket barbecue meal I had just eaten when <laughs> I had to go on stage. Like, that, that I'll always remember, just the terror of, like, is this is this going to be the night that it happens? Right. Um but uh, but typically, unless something's crazy, like crazy forceful like that, they just those sorts of things go away with adrenaline, I guess. And uh, right. what was really different about this is usually like there's a process I'm accustomed to playing a show where it's like my body is resistant at first, even if I've come up before, but then I, I kind of physically blossom into it if I if I approach it right and get get like that second win. But I've never played for long enough where that completely dissipated. Right. Again, and it was like, oh, I'm not going to get a third win. This is just, I guess, kind of, <laughs> I just have to coast on this for as long as I still have. Which, uh, check my watches, a long fucking time. All right, here we go. Wow. Uh, but that was a cool, that was a cool um, aspect of it in of itself. It was, it was a really fun thing to do. You know, and just like, no pretensions of of anything being particularly great or perfect. Just, just going for it. You know. Yeah. Just having fun with it. Yeah. Celebration of all the bands. Right. Um, and, and people have a lot of fun with it. Guys wore like their own bad shirts or um, got like custom facial hair, grooming <laughs> yeah. styles going. Yeah, it was, it was a great time. Nice man. Since this whole COVID thing's been going down, uh, has yeah. it spoiled any uh, uh, touring show or recording plans? Yes, for sure. All of the above, I think. <laughs> Everything. Um, yeah, you know, it's, it's pretty brutal. I mean, I definitely I definitely had a couple recording sessions that haven't materialized. Definitely no rehearsals, and I'm pretty sure I'm supposed to be on tour with somebody, but it's also so surreal and so long ago now at this point uh, that I, I can't even really recall how definite those plans actually were. I feel like they were fairly definite. Um, oh, man. I know I had some, some summer tour plans, but it feels like another lifetime at this point. Yeah. But yeah, long gone. Damn, dude. There's been some cool sort of consolation prize aspects to that. Like, Kralis just released a new thing, and we actually intended to record a whole another chunk of material for that thing. We, we kind of rehearsed one chunk of stuff, recorded it, learned the next chunk, recorded it, and we were about to do round three, mm-hmm. and uh, then everything went to hell. Right. And it, it seemed like it wasn't going to 
going to clear up anytime soon. So eventually we were like, well, maybe we should just just call this it. And at this point, I'm I'm really glad we did because I think I think what we released is stronger as it is than it would have been if we had been able to see our plans to fruition and and put on a whole another like third or maybe a little less quarter of material. Yeah. Man, Kraus is a crazy man. I know we spoke a little bit about it, but for those who maybe haven't listened to that, and I believe, if I recall correctly, that was the 51st episode when I last spoke to you, like I said, about three years ago. But, I mean, and just looking at how many records Kraus has put out uh, in, tw- in a 12-year 12, 12 time span, and it's nine full-length records in 12 <laughs> years. That sounds about right. Yeah, maybe three EPs uh, and then nine full-length records in a, in a 12-year span, uh, which is pretty impressive. So I guess uh, when you get together with those guys, is it a shit ton of rehearsing? Is a lot of rehearsing in, uh, outside of it uh, on your own to really nail down parts and minimal actual collective rehearsing time, uh, to, especially given everything that's going on now? Do you just have to do a lot of homework outside of it and then come in as prepared as possible and do the whole thing? So to some extent, um, the answer is just kind of yes. It, it really depends on uh, on the context of of the material, which varies enough that we, we just take kind of fundamentally different approaches to how to work it sometimes. As a general rule, I can say for myself, I'm definitely the shittiest about uh, doing homework on my own. I definitely thrive the most in, in, in jamming in some aspect uh-huh. in the room with the guys. Um, and that often means that there's a, a fairly tremendous backlog for me to attack. But the, depending yeah. on on who's sort of started the song, who's the principal writer, and how we want to go about approaching it, and sort of how the drums are going to be mm-hmm. constructed, it, it can be very different in terms of how much is done in the root jamming to formulate parts. Or for for a bunch of the songs that actually Nick, our bassist, wrote for for this record, Colin, um, he had this new toy, which is like one of those sort of um, finger tap drum machine guys where it's like square buttons that uh-huh. you hit with yeah. your fingers yeah so, which allowed him to like get really crazy with uh orchestrated drum parts that didn't have to be on a grid um mm-hmm. and to just sort of let himself go and then uh it became my sometimes laborious but always enjoyable job of, of trying to figure out how to how to play that stuff and orchestrate it so right. there was a huge suite of the songs for this this record that just came out where it, my process started sitting down on his couch and writing these charts with just all the time signature changes and, and how he counted stuff. So we were on the same page and, and then writing out, writing out specific drum parts to the extent where I couldn't do it with any kind of verbal shorthand. And then going from that to the practice room, just the two of us kind of getting a handle on it mm-hmm. or chunks of them at a time. And then, and then slowly morphing into a full band thing. Wow. But for some of the other stuff on this record that, uh, Mick, um, was the principal writer on it started with uh, just uh, the two of us being in a room without nearly as much or any um, direction with drums and just, just jamming it out. And we kind of, at some point, I think over the years with all the stuff we've done had every, every approach under this sub, which is really fun. The fluidity of it is one of the things I really value Mm -hmm. um, that we're all, we're all pretty adaptable. Right. Right. You and I had a conversation some time ago, and you were talking about how you, how you uh, all, as as far as click tracks are concerned, you you like to uh, practice with them and record with them, but never really play live with them. But for this, uh, in the instance of where you recorded some of these songs off this new uh, record that you're talking about with Kralis, you had mentioned that that Colin, I guess, did some stuff where it didn't need to be on a grid. Did you then record those songs not to a click? Well, uh, it's a good question. I mean. Uh... The general way Kralis works is that um, we don't, you know, I, when I say I like to practice, do like I mean my own sort of doing exercises and drills kind of practice. Yeah. In terms of as a band, it's something that we just really don't particularly engage with. Period. Mm-hmm. Um, there's like one or two moments on some of the early albums where there's sections that we wanted uh, to be either fast enough or slow enough that that we that we track uh, little little fragments. Of, of old songs where before we started tracking everything live anyway mm-hmm. to a click, but it was pretty, pretty damn rare yeah. thing anyway. And, and for the most, we just don't, we neither record nor rehearse to a click at all. And we're, we're just always trying to fudge tempos totally. sort of organically. Sometimes, sometimes we'll check in, you know, like somebody will be like, I want this to be, the demo is around here. Let's see where that is compared to like what we're doing. Right. But it's, it's it becomes its own thing. And that's kind of always, always the vibe. Yeah. So these were no different. 
maybe a little more referencing. I can't really remember because there's, there's definitely some abrupt tempo changes as well as sort of, you know, just subdivision or time signature right. uh, fuckery. Yeah. My God, I bet. It's fun, though. I mean, I mean, one of the things I love doing, especially with this band, is sort of surging um, and not feeling like I have to be on this sort of unchanging grid, but really get to push and pull and sort of rubber band parts when we're playing music. It doesn't have a tremendous amount of dynamic range in terms of loud to quiet, you know? Right. Uh, well, amidst all of this downtime and whatnot, you're not out touring, you're not out playing shows. Uh, it sounds like you can work uh, to some degree on rehearsing. But uh, on as far as rehearsing on your own, what have you been? Uh, have you been working on anything in particular and ironed out any particular aspects about your own playing? Uh, great question. I mean, um, that's mostly I think what I've been doing with this time. It's still something I, I, I need to do and want to do more is sort of engage back with actual music, mm. but it still feels just, just pretty weird. There's some exciting stuff I have to do in that capacity for Kralis. Like there's a, there's one of the newer songs that um, I want to, I want to just start hacking away at it here with the demos I have from those guys. Mm-hmm. And they also want me to, to do some dumb reverse engineering, which is going to be a lot of fun where I, I record myself just in here flailing away, kind of creating, drum riffs for a song that doesn't exist and then I'll send that to the guys and they'll they'll write riffs to it. There you and we'll go. do a song that, sort of backwards. So that will be really fun. But yeah, for the most part, I've just been drilling like fuck. Um and uh for for the whole beginning of quarantine I, I wasn't coming into my practice space at all. I was I just had like a my kick pad at home with a bunch of pillows on it. And uh and that was that was it. Um and I was doing that for months. Wow. Um, and, uh, you know, realizing I wasn't going to retain that much when I went back to like a real kick drum, but that hopefully it would be somewhat didactically useful. And I, I think yeah. I got a decent amount out of it, actually. Wow. Um, and then I, I've just I've been doing a lot of the continuation of that sort of stuff in the room. Um, so it's been a mix of like really trying to hone in and get ever sort of more correctly deep in terms of uh, understanding the way I move and how that how comfort and, and sort of first principles of looseness and all that sort of stuff are way more important than any specificity of technique, mm-hmm. especially as I'm going through very usually sort of going through uh, a large tempo progression with any exercise I do. So I've been sort of um, uh, um, exchanging that with these sessions where I'll just blast myself with uh, sort of songs on shuffle mm-hmm. um, of whatever, whatever genre and just, try to play for a little while to capture the feel um yeah. and then and then kind of blast away or double kick away under the under the top of of like a chris christopherson tune or whatever it is <laughs> nice. um just just butchery but but you know a useful butchery sometimes or often i do that in such a way where i'm not particularly concerned with whether i can hear myself or not mm. um i'm just trying to slow really right um, and i like to contra- contrast that with sort of of super focused attention when I'm doing very simple drills over long tempo range for a long ass time. Right. Um, and kind of, kind of, uh, psychotomize the two I find really useful too, in terms of breaking up the monotony of motion and giving, giving some of myself a, a rest. Um, funny enough, often when I'm like bashing away on the drums, it really eases up some of the muscular tension that builds when I'm like just doing kick drills or something like that. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, I've found, and it's always been the weaker aspect about my playing in general, but I've been focusing more mm-hmm. on just doing dub- more double bass stuff, period. And I do find that when, uh, maybe because in my instance, it is one of the weaker uh, aspects of my playing and one that I, I haven't spent the most time on over the years, mm-hmm. boy, it gets pretty sloppy pretty quick if I don't kind of stay up on it. Absolutely. Yeah, my hands will come back uh, even if I'm a little mm-hmm. bit rusty. But man, yep. my feet are just uh, can be a mess. It's crazy. Absolutely. Very rare for me to talk to another drummer who plays heavy music who doesn't feel like their feet are far worse in all the ways you're describing than their hands in a constant frustration and struggle. Right. Um, and also what you're describing, I think, is a, is a very particular and pretty important aspect of that struggle, which is, I know it's something I've had to get over personally to progress more, is this the fact that it does go away and you kind of have to finesse things back a little more. So you, what that really means is that you have to deal with listening to yourself sound sloppy and listening to yourself sound like shit. Yeah. And, and 
and, and sticking with it and relaxing through it and sorting it out. Mm-hmm. And I know that for me personally, first of all, I agree with your general gripe that you know, my, my feet, um, I work on them all the damn time, um, sometimes with fairly diminishing returns, and they're always going to be much weaker with my hands, both as a general thing and also as something that I have to constantly keep up in some way as opposed to the hands where I can – I got them back pretty quick after four months of not really using them at all. You know, <laughs> right. the first couple of days, first couple of days, I was huffing and puffing a little, and my fingers were all tore up. But yeah. uh, I feel I feel like I haven't met nearly as much of a step as I deserve to have. Um, yeah. Whereas I, I can't I can't imagine how how poor my feet would have been if I hadn't been working them consistently during this whole process. So right. so absolutely, I feel you. And for me, I know that I had to get over. You know, I would push two tempos where I started to not be comfortable, and then stuff would start to sound sloppy, yep. and I couldn't tolerate it. So I'd like stop or retreat or or try to force my way through and do all all the stuff I would tell students to not do. And it was almost like having a lack of empathy that you can have for others, but you can't have for yourself. And so far, it's just like, no, you just because you're sloppy right now, you know how this works. Right. Uh, you have to you have to relax through it. You have to the way you know a metaphor I've used a lot was if you you know you're at your your suburban house and you got that outdoor garden hose but you turn it on and the water runs all all nasty and muddy and red for a little bit yeah and the, the only thing you have to do is let the damn hose run and it's, <laughs> it's going to get clear pretty quickly that's a lot of what we all struggle against with double kick stuff is like the, the difference between playing it sloppily and playing it cleanly is often incredibly minute physically and mostly just has to do with not trying to force things right and relax into it and learn how to flow with it mm-hmm. but and, and i know for myself even when my i think my objectivity on these matters is not great i've heard that exchange happen like the difference between night and day between a take you know or two takes four minutes apart from each other in the studio yeah. where uh you know it's a song with like a bunch of double kick and i get in and i'm like yeah i think that sounded like shit and i listen back and it's clumpy as hell and i do it again and uh it's fine, you know, right. and it's just it's just a, a few minutes of, of getting a little warmer, you know. Mm-hmm. But buying into that process of, of dealing with the sloppiness is really hard, especially when it's so much more of a thing with our feet, I think, for so many of us than it is with our hands. Right. Um, and, and it is just a weirder thing. You know, I've had, well, I think maybe one of my, one of the impetuses for wanting to get in touch and chat with you again is I've had this really cool experience in the past few weeks of having a lot of super deep conversations with sort of my most seminal teacher growing up, the dude who was my teacher from like when I was a, a preteen uh, in the city to when I left for school. And then when I came back, I'd still take lessons with him. Right. And yeah. he's, he's a phenomenal drummer. He's an amazing player. And he's been this like freelance guy, mostly recording guy and freelance guy in the city for forever. Wow. But now in his, um, in his like older age, he's like pursuing way more, stuff for himself and he's always been a metal guy mm. but he's never really been a thing he was like a hardcore player when in his really early days so he's never a metal player even though he gave me like a tape with creator and possessed on it and stuff like that when i was 12 you know yeah. um, but he hit me up and he's like this double bass shit is impossible it's like i'm starting <laughs> all over again and so I've, I've i've gotten to have the privilege of talking with the sort of master about all this stuff but but it also is an acknowledgement of how alien it it is in some ways and how weird and not like has the way our bodies function with the rest of this stuff. Right. He's trying to sort of reinvent his basic methodologies of playing to accommodate figuring out how to get speed on the, on the double kick. And one of the things I was sort of able to tell him is that, listen, I'm not an absolute speed demon, but I have absolutely been able to apply your general methodologies of how to play drums well in a non-metal context or a more, generally applicable context mm-hmm. and use that for, for doing stuff like playing double bass without having to make any major compromises or mm. get real small and twitch, twitchy with things. Right. So stay the, stay the course, man. And you know, your own, your own approach is really good and it will work. I promise. Yeah. But stuff is hard. It's really hard. Yeah. 
I, one of the things that I also found is that, again, yet another difference between my hands and my feet is that generally speaking, I can sit down to a kit and not really warm up that much with my hands. And then I may go through a little awkwardness, but then inevitably they, they warm up and maybe it's a little clunky if when I'm doing fills, For sure. but it's so obvious when, when, when your feet aren't firing right. And it just fucks up everything when you're trying to play grooves over that. And the, the whole foundation of what you're playing is clunky. And, you know, as a, as one of the drummers that interviewed, you call it popcorn feet. Oh, pop, popcorn is absolutely <laughs> a favorite term of mine too. Um, yeah. And, and dude, dude, for sure. I mean, uh, but I, at least for myself, and I know that you're absolutely right. I religiously try to warm up my feet to limited success before shows. And I don't bother with the hands at all because right. I know that I might get, I might get a little stressed, mm-hmm. but they're going to take care of themselves. They know how to, how to warm up and relax into what I need to do. But the feet, it feels like they're, their brain is much dumber and I I have to sort of, I have to impose every time. But one thing I've also learned to at least try to do, uh, and it's really important for me to do both in terms of success at shows, but also my general approach to playing shows, not making it such a, such a final exam that I inevitably fail sort of thing for myself. Uh When I, when I, when inevitably the feet have their moment, which they're going to have, because I've got probably going to be playing with a little too much, a little too much muscle, a little too much force, a little too much stomp, because that's what adrenaline does. Yeah. And I need to learn how to relax. They're going to have their moment. I, I know from experience that if I embrace the fact that I'm going to sound like shit for five seconds, I'm mm. going to be able to blossom physically out of it, warm up like that garden hose, and work my way through it. Mm. Sometimes can't help myself but do it. I think a lot of us do. Is they're like, oh, God, this is – everybody can hear my popcorn feet. This is – <laughs> terrible i'll throw in a fill or i'll, I'll, I'll retreat right. from it in some way yeah and all that does is it forestalls me having to engage that when when my feet get tired again in, in another longest passage or something right and until i learn my lesson and just sort of let myself get real ugly for a second and learn how to accommodate it it's gonna make for a worse show and i'm gonna have a much less fun time yep but yep. also you know i've been record recorded enough over the years that i could say with some certainty that Sometimes I'm just wrong. Um, sometimes <laughs> shows where I thought I thought I thought my feet were garbage. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'll hear I'll hear a very unkind, thought like sort of recording of it. And sure, there are moments, but overall, my brain has done a very unfair job of characterizing what's going on because it was to my brain more of a physical struggle than it was supposed to be. Mm-hmm. But that doesn't always mean it was bad. It's yeah. very hard for us not to equate that with that if we're huffing and puffing and working, because mm-hmm. it does mean that we're doing something kind of dumb yeah. in our approach, yeah. and whether we can help it or not. And sometimes you can't help it, you know? Right. Fucking A, man. And another thing that we spoke about the last time, which I think is always interesting, it's something that I certainly enjoy in drummers that play heavier styles of music and, and faster styles of music, obviously below a certain BPM threshold, because as we were talking mm-hmm. about it, you know, once it gets so brutally fast, it's all kind of just small twitch muscles and you're just flying through the mm-hmm. shit. But uh, yeah, right. I do like employing the sort of physicality uh, of it, uh, and, uh, both from just the way the drums sound, the volume that happens, as you said, if, if you're dealing with a not so well mic situation or not mic'd at all, people can hopefully still hear you. <laughs> there's, there's, there's all of those things to consider. Uh, but in, 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 in saying that, do you use triggers on your bass drums? No, I did for a while, long, long, long time ago when I was playing in some death metal bands in like college and stuff. But uh-huh. honestly, I was always incredibly intimidated in technology and didn't really know how to set them up. Yeah. I was playing with Nick in those bands at the time. I had one capacity, another still, the bassist from Carlos, because we went to high school together here. Yeah. And he was my trigger man. Like, he, he, he set it up. He figured out how to work the module and how to make it not misfire. Oh, wow. I had no idea how to, work, how to work the thing. It's just a matter of, of just, like, what you care about. And I don't, don't really care about super articulated kick drum hits. Like, it doesn't bother me if I can't hear that mm-hmm. as... As like as like an artificially distinct sound at a show, you know. Although I also grew up listening to the like late '90s and early 2000s, really ugly death metal production where the kick all sounded like typewriters, and I kind of totally. loved that. Right. Uh, <laughs> but it's just not my vibe, you know. Yeah. But I think it does really aid in some ways the development of, for instance, fast double bass in some ways because yeah. what you get, what you get from a trigger, which you don't get from real life is clarity for mm-hmm. one thing you get a, a 
sameness of the left and the right that a lot of guys just don't actually possess, right. even if they're playing 100%. somewhat even strokes. Yeah, and, and I know I, I fall into that category some of the time. Sometimes I'm more, even when I'm even, I'm more even in terms of the attack between the feet, and sometimes I'm less so, and it shows up on a mic yeah. in a way it doesn't show up on a trigger. Yeah. And also velocity, and, and guys who use triggers will tell you that they can adjust the dynamic range, mm-hmm. but I don't think most guys who play death metal are doing a ton of of that because it's not in their interest. It would be kind of a crazy thing to do, especially if they want the really soft hits to, to show up. You're right. Um, but, you know, you, you do learn how to ease up and how little motion in some ways it takes to manipulate the pedal in a way that's very hard, I think, for the brain to buy into Yeah. when you're not getting back a loud sound for that. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think there's something to – sometimes over the years I've regretted not, like, having – my module somewhere, I still have it. I just don't use it, it, but I don't know if I have a working trigger or whatever. Sometimes I regret not having it as a practice tool for myself. Right. But I also like, I like hearing what I actually sound like acoustically at yeah. different tempos. Yeah. And, and, and seeing what, what the vibe is and because it, what I never want to lose from drugs, one of the reasons that I, I don't use triggers as a matter of personal preference is um, if it's an acoustic instrument, it's not necessarily a one-to-one relationship between the motion you employ to hit the thing mm-hmm. and what you get out of it, but it, there's a very deep relationship there. Whereas yeah. the minute that you sound replace, that relationship goes away, just fundamentally changes in some very significant way. Mm-hmm. It becomes sort of less, less, um, less of a of an obvious function of input to output. Mm-hmm. So I like to I like to be able to see in real time how differences in the way I'm moving myself relate to different sounds that I'm getting out of, you know, even the kick drum mm-hmm. as I'm playing it. I'm like in the room by myself. Um, yeah. And, you know, sometimes, sometimes I'll, I'll throw a mic in it. Uh, that's about as much of a concession I'll make, but typically not. Typically I'm just hitting it as it is. I'll turn the snare off. So I get a little bit more of the sound of the thing rounder, less attack to hear, yeah. to hear even this or not even this, but you know, and it's going to get quieter and quieter as the tempo spectrum decreases. Right. But that's fine. And, and and in terms of what you're talking about, throughout that, I'm still trying to employ, and much more these days, uh, in a way that's, that's really consistent with stuff I talked about last time we got together, but I don't think I had bought into as much for my feet. Mm-hmm. Trying to still always use a full range of motion to let things be on a chain of, of big to small with my legs the same way I want them to act with my arms. Mm-hmm. You know, even even if I'm getting to tempos where the ankle might have to sort of take over in some ways, it doesn't mean that I want my leg to isolate the ankle mm-hmm. any more than I want the wrist to be isolated when I'm playing fast with my hands. Mm-hmm. I want my whole leg to still be kind of jelly and fluid behind that. Yeah. Um, and I think those sorts of realizations are, are aided by not having a barrier between you and the sound you're created mm-hmm. to not sound too pretentious about it. Right, right. I mean, I think if you want that sound without the technology, you can sort of do things to to EQ or alter the the sound of both your bass drum and or the beater that you're using on the kick pedal. If you want to use a wooden uh, beater and oh, then, yeah. and then put you know I don't know a pillow or whatever in there, you're gonna get a kind of clickier oh, yeah. sound anyway. And then you can still, uh, I suppose, do that without the technology of the of the triggers. Uh, that's maybe For one sure. way I mean, it. I'm sure I'm sure you remember that hilarious trend where they sell like the what are those called, like, the Phalanx Slams? But they would have, like, um, a stupid, like, metal insert to, oh like, fake the trigger sound. Yeah. I had one of those when I was, I was like, 15. I'm pretty damn sure. Right. Smacking them with my Iron Cobras that were already, like, like amazing lightweight sledgehammer pedals. I think right. I kind of missed. Um, but, uh, <laughs> and, and, and I remember always hearing that Vinnie Paul, before he triggered, if he triggered, like, did, did the, like, the old quarter and the kick drum trick or whatever. Yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah, there are ways to get that sound, but like, I'm not necessarily looking for that sound. I get why. I hear you. Why, why that sounds good. I ask for it often. If I think a sound guy, if a sound guy is friendly enough, and seems confident enough mm-hmm. uh, at a show that I feel like I'm not going to get flowered at by making a request. Yeah. Um, I'll often ask for, for in my, in my monitor, not in the house, if I can specify, but just for my monitor, for him to give me as triggery a mic sound as he can cut out as much low end as, as, as he can mm-hmm. so that I'm, I'm hearing myself as, as cleanly as I can without it just being like, a which is so typical out of the drum monitor as I'm sure you're familiar with. Yeah. But that's not what I would like my kick drums to sound like in the house, even though it's, 
it's more clarity. I don't think it's a better sound. You know? Right. Yeah, I'd agree. And I'm sure you've been at death metal shows where like the mix is just atrocious because <laughs> they're not taking into account the fact that the triggers don't vary in volume naturally. Yeah. Like a mic hit drum. So the sound that's fine if a guy's going do 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 is overwhelming with trigger if he's going you know it's just, right that's all you hear is triggers and vocals <laughs> no riffs or anything else and yeah. it's just it, it ain't it ain't fun it ain't a good uh transfusion of that music right but sometimes i am just blown away by those guys you know <laughs> i've heard that this for like other bands with the guy seems like he he's just supremely clean at light speed uh you know yeah. it does wow me right um, right do you have a uh, particular BPM uh, where you just kind of top out? Uh, where, like, if you're playing blast beats, for instance, instance where you're like, I think this is probably about where I'm topping out before this turns into, you know, a, a clusterfuck. Yeah. So for me, those, you know, I'm constantly trying to push those thresholds without making any compromises in terms of the stuff I just was talking about. Yeah. So, so to see how far I can take a general approach of trying more and more to just not worry about even the notion of technique, but try to go to principles that stand before that of like balance, comfort, relaxation, fluidity, mm-hmm. and seeing how far, how far those can take me. Um, but it, it varies for sure between my hands and my feet pretty tremendously. Mm-hmm. So, so it's a, you know, if we're talking a black seat, for sure, the extent to which I can get away one footing that comfortably, uh, is a much earlier threshold than for when sure. I can, uh, so to, to where I could take it if I'm doing the so-called duck walk. Right. Um, yeah. Um, so, so I haven't, I haven't necessarily checked in, but my hands, when they're in a pretty good place, can hold a blast beat. They start to lose it somewhere. I'd say between 240 and 250. Yeah. If I want to do it for any, any significant length of time. Yeah. But if I'm in 220, 230, I can still, I can still hang sort of playing the way I want to. Mm-hmm. Uh, if I'm, if I'm, if I'm nice and warm. Yeah. My 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 feet for sure can't hang comfortably at those sorts of tempos, but they're getting they're getting much better, and I'm finally starting to make I think a, a lot. You know, it's it's one of these things where a lot of the work I put in over the years feels mm-hmm. like it's started really actually starting to to break through a wall with with the willingness of doing what I was kind of talking about before with the feet and practice of pushing into those tempos. There, my brain's like, oh no, fast, fast, fast. And being like, no, fucking relax, guy. Just because you sounded bad on that one doesn't mean that you're going to sound bad on the next one. And also, right. also realizing that uh, it's not a given that you know I do these exercises where they're incredibly simple. Uh, basically, I'm doing some sort of eighth note or sixteenth note pattern with my legs mm-hmm. at a tempo which would, that would be kind of a thirty second note, right? Or X amount of measures with the tempo increasing by one BPM, Y amount of measures. And I just do that for a long ass time. Mm-hmm. And sometimes, sometimes the way it works is when I'm approaching, let's say usually like 175 ish, mm-hmm. I start to feel like I'm losing control a little bit. And I know that if I, if I throw in the towel there, it's going to feel like that's an actual tempo threshold. But if I actually relax and work through it, it's just sort of this period of adjustment. And then I feel a uh, kind of fine for a, a long ass time thereafter. Right. Uh, but it's about sticking, sticking with it and relaxing. So these days, um, depending on how long I'm pushing for and what kind of thing I'm doing, um, with some degree of clarity, I'm, I've been being for the first time in my days, starting to be able to push past like 220 yeah. a little bit, but in some ways I'm still hanging out to my ass, uh, depending on how good I'm feeling that day, anywhere above 200, depending <laughs> on how long I need to do stuff yeah. and for what it's going to be. Totally. Depending on how I'm feeling physically, the tempo varies when I kind of check in, if I'm checking in. Mm-hmm. Uh, but there's there's always periods of adjustment where I have to be like, okay, you're struggling now, which means that you're pressing too much, you're stabbing too much, and you're not relaxed enough. You're working too hard and you're working stupidly. Mm-hmm. So ease up, keep moving fluidly. Is anything locking up? Because that often happens to me too. I'll notice that like, my leg is kicking really well, mm-hmm. but my foot is like – ran it uh, on the pedal and I'll, and I'll particularly do this weird thing where the ball of my foot is still in really nice comfortable contact the way I want it to be with the footboard but somehow my toes are arched up in the air and not in contact with the footboard right. and sort of throws it into this weirdly agonizing position <laughs> and if I try to solve that through technique I, I usually fail hmm. but if I try to just go like alright just try to move everything wiggle around ease up 
dance and be relaxed and in balance, I can work through that. Um, mm-hmm. And it's, there's a, I think there's a lot of important lesson in that kind of approach. Right. And for me, it's a lot of, of not being a hypocrite and kind of practicing to myself what I've been preaching to students. There's something to be said for sure, I think, for uh, not totally taking stock on every little uh, little mistake over the course of, of a performance to the extent that you psych yourself out and make the thing actually worse. Absolutely. You got to realize, I think, that, uh, you know, it's not the end of the world, obviously, and uh, you got to roll mm-hmm. with it sometimes, man. And literally, like like you said, roll a fill. Roll Just with fucking it. Re- yeah, reset absolutely. yourself with a fill, whatever the fuck you got to do. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I can't remember who I was having this conversation with, but kind of exactly to what you're saying. We've all had that experience. If you play the show and you have any sort of, whether bad or good, self-awareness, we've all had that experience where we've gotten off of the stage sort of shaking our heads and somebody has come up to us and been like, dude, that's the best show you've ever played. Right. And, and you know, if you're if you're able to have the, the sort of charity that you would like to, you're able to say, oh, dude, thank you, and maybe are able to resist saying, like, you're so dumb. That was the worst show I've ever played in my life. Right. Uh, do you have ears? You know, like, could you, could you hear me up there? And one thing I realized over the years is that that guy, in a lot of fundamentally objective ways, he's more right than I am because I, like any player on that stage, thinking about mistakes is giving them metrically in terms of what the overall performance has. It's far more weight than they ever really had in reality. Mm-hmm. So my perspective of it being a terrible show isn't really a more valid perspective than his one of it being an amazing show. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and into that, I know that for myself, the more I can approach a show of like, I just want to actually enjoy myself up here, feel the music and like have fun with my dudes yep. and not make it a, a test for myself. Not only do, do I do that, but the more I'm having fun, the less I fuck up and the better right. I deal with fuck ups when they happen because I'm not, I'm not like, Oh no, you fool. You've done it. You've ruined Christmas. Um, which is such an easy trap to fall into. And then it spirals, you know, yeah. but it's all in your head. Uh, totally. and, uh, and getting out of that headspace has been a long process for me, but really healthy in terms of like, Oh yeah, I'm supposed to have fun doing this. Right. And shocking, shockingly, if I have fun doing it, I'm better at it. <laughs> I move better. I play better. I fuck up less, and I deal with the fuck ups more adroitly. Right. Yeah. It sounds so self evident when you say it that way, but it doesn't always come that easy when it's happening. Oh my no, god. No, you get you get mired in it very easily. Totally. You know, because we all care. We all care about. We all care about the music we're making and when we're toiling away in this dumb underground field, you know. Right. And and conveying it faithfully is really important to us. Yeah. Um, and it's it's a, and, and especially for drumming when it's like a physical failure. Uh, it's so frustrating. Um, it's really hard sometimes to get out of the headspace of evaluating yourself. Like, can I really do this stuff or not? You know, that was an awful show. I right. feel like a fraud sort of thing. And it's just <laughs> it's just not only is it damaging uh, psychically, but it's just silly it's not yeah. scientifically sound so right to speak. totally man well you mentioned teaching earlier have you been able to teach throughout this uh digitally or you know you be, have you been able to do that yeah i, I have uh, not a ton you know um but i have a handful of uh mostly rotated cast with some staples of, of virtual students nice some who were in-person students who are now virtual some from here who are new or other parts of the country where it's like, Oh, I guess it doesn't really matter right now if yeah. I live in California. Um, yeah. yeah. And I have, I have one student I've been seeing in person just very carefully yeah. uh, nice. just at, at, a, at a distance. But um, yeah, still, you know, still figuring out how to do the remote thing too. It's really, the technology is not good for drum teaching. I don't, yeah, I, I agree. It's really rough, but it's, it's, you know, it, it also makes me just adjust my approach. It means that I'm going to do a hell of a lot less, playing myself during lessons Mm -hmm. and a lot more talking yeah um which which could work you know but it's a little harder with kids sometimes sure Um, you know for me there's there's an added wrinkle where i'm I'm talking right now from my practice space where i've been spending a tremendous amount of time now i started just kind of walking in from my it's in brooklyn from my place in queens yeah Uh, but the internet here even like just over the network is awful so (laughs) if a student needs to zoom with me i need to do it from home yeah. where I just have like a couple pet pads anyway. Uh, mm-hmm. And from here, I can't do video where my drums are with any any actual success. So yeah. so it's it's, um, it's still kind of getting differences between like Zoom and Skype and FaceTime for the idiosyncrasies and the ways they work. Totally. So it's been cool. It's been really weird, but 
I've had some fun with it also. Nice. You know, I, I'm in such a weird contrast, like day to day, of just not really speaking to people <laughs> yeah. in the way that used to be a rarity. And then I'll do a lesson where I'm, like I said, I'm talking way more than I usually do. And also, I talk too loudly when I'm teaching in person for sure, because I'm so used to having to shout over people smacking right. the stare while I'm trying to say something. <laughs> yeah. But also, I just talk, I talk too loudly, period. And I still <laughs> talk too loudly over the phone. So, like, I know that one of the things I haven't adjusted to is my voice is shredded after like a single lesson wow. these days because it's just uh, it goes from like not being used for eight hours or something to <laughs> to like to blab blathering and then i'm like oh man <laughs> and then and then i'm like do i have covid is that, is that what my, my threat's <laughs> Oh, shit, man. That is hilarious. It has definitely brought out the inner hypochondriac in uh, just about everybody. And if you were uh, predisposed to any sort of hypochondriacal neurosis leading to this, then you're <laughs> you're just fucked. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And I, I had a hilarious moment where, uh, like, one of, the, one of the first, maybe the first day I came back to the space. So, A, I had just, I just walked, like, an hour and a half in, like, 95-degree weather into the space. Yeah. And then I was playing like full body drums for the first time. <laughs> and if I'm not mistaken, I, I just broke in a fast of like only using CBD for like a few weeks and go back to THC. Right. Um, so I am just like melting in there. I'm having a great time, but I'm also like, oh man, I am. Woo. And I, I have to admit that there is a, a you know a stoned idiotic part of myself which is like, oh no, am I like a, do I have asymptomatic lung? Lung damage? Is that what this is? And it's like, no, you moron. You just walked like miles in 100 degree heat and like 50 degree humidity, and then you played drums like like a junkie hitting their old ghost for like two yeah. hours without stopping. Like, <laughs> you're just an idiot. You're not, you're, you, you don't have permanent lung damage. You're just really dumb. <laughs> but there, there, uh. there's definitely been a few moments like that for myself where I've had to be like, no. Yeah. Think it through. <laughs> yep. Oh my God, dude. You know, one of the last times I saw you outside of said practice space, you were saying that you did a recording with Pyra Latris that I believe has yet to be put out, correct? Yeah. So we, uh, we're really stoked on it. Um, and it, it still needs mastering. Uh, okay. we have like one song mastered that was like a sample, which we really like. I think we just maybe need to make a few tweaks too, but not really. And, mm -hmm. uh, and then we'll figure out what to do with it. It's gotten so, there's been such a weird extra limbo because there's an uncertainty before this whole situation went down as to exactly what we were going to do with it. Cause we had sort of intentions through one label and they were into it, but it was going to have to be like a really long time. Mm -hmm. So we were playing around with uh, shopping it and seeing if anybody else had interest and could do it maybe quicker. Mm -hmm. And now that's almost a moot point because right. who the hell knows. So we're sort of back to square zero a little bit or maybe, maybe just going to go with our original guys and see what happens, but yeah. I can't wait for it to come out. I'm, I'm really stoked on it. Um, it was, it was a cool record to make. Um, and, uh, I, I, I think it sounds fantastic. Um, nice. At some point we'll see the light of day. Yeah. Well, you know, one of the other nice parts of being still in kind of limbo is being forced to like sit down and listen to stuff like that. <laughs> yeah. Take stock of it. You know, yeah. for, you know, for the beginning, beginning months, especially before I started, coming into the space again i was just having a really hard time engaging with my own music it was just depressing you know right it was just so frustrating to be severed from my thing and as as i've sort of been able to like get get back into it like having having the the time where it's like i'm forced to listen to the new kralis and the new pyro and be like oh this stuff's cool and sort of get get a you know, Mr. Robinson, this is your life or whatever sort of thing. It's, it's, it can be nice, you know? Yeah. It, it's, it's cool to, like, you know, be forced to stop. Cause, you know, Kralis is, we got tons of stuff that the work, you know, music to work on. And, Always, and I'm yeah. already a little, a little bit behind again. So, you know, it's fun, to, it's fun to get back to it in whatever fashion we can. But also it was nice to sort of have the frozen moment for a little bit of just being like, oh, man, I should try to listen to and enjoy the stuff I've done besides just being tunnel visioned on the next thing all the time. You know? Totally. Well, shit, I look forward to hearing uh, all these mini projects that are going to be coming out at various times. But uh, as, <laughs> as is often the case, uh, they're always interesting and quite cool and, and, and can be out there, in there, all over the place, the spectrum of shit you do. <laughs> so uh, I'm looking forward to hearing it when, uh, when it comes out, man. Well, me too. Appreciate it. Well, Lev, it was good talking to you again, dude. Uh, we'll have to catch up soon. 
Absolutely. Best of luck going forward. I'll put a link in uh, for people to contact you if they want uh, want to take lessons and uh, the links to all of your mini projects as well. <laughs> Sounds great. And always a pleasure. That was really fun. Thanks for letting me blather around. Of course. Anytime, man. Good talking to you, buddy. <laughs> yeah, you too, man. All right, everybody, thanks for tuning in to another episode, and thanks to Lev for rapping and imparting his wisdom. Some really good approaches there that I'm already starting to employ in my own plan, so I appreciate the insight. We'll catch you all in the next one. 200 episodes are just around the bend. Crash, bang, boom.